Welcome everyone. We're going to talk about basic organic naming today. Let me begin with a caveat that we're not going to talk about and show examples of everything that we can possibly do with organic naming. This is primarily to get you a primer so when we come into class we can focus on practicing and adding all the details rather than just going through the nitty gritty. Let's start by talking about why organic naming is so different from inorganic naming. Because carbon is so versatile, there are many, many ways you can put together the same combination of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, especially when you start tossing in oxygens and chlorines and all sorts of other things. There are so many ways to take the same atoms and rearrange them. It's like Legos. So when we have a name, we have to indicate how many carbons are in the longest carbon chain. We have to indicate if the carbon chain branches, and if so, how many atoms are in that branch, and where does the branching happen? We also have to talk about what else is on the molecule. Are there any extra substituents like halogens or nitrogens? Are there oxygen atoms? Are there double bonds, triple bonds? The name has to tell us all of those things. So we have to be very methodical with their name. And once you get the pattern down, you can build the most complicated names possible. We're starting with layer one. If you take organic chemistry in college, they'll add another layer so things get even fancier. But once you've got the process down, it just builds. It's super, super mm, linear in the way you're gonna go about this naming. Okay, let's talk about the basic format for an organic name. You have a prefix, and that prefix is gonna tell you about whatever substituents and branching, branching you have. In other words, what's all the fanciness on your molecule? And that prefix can get pretty complicated because it's gonna tell you not only what is attached, but where you're gonna find them on the molecule. The parent name is the core. So this is the center of our name, and it's gonna tell us how many carbons are in that longest carbon chain. And then our suffix at the end of the name is gonna tell us what's the most important functional group that we have in this molecule. So when we have, take a look at trying to tell someone what is the core of my molecule, we're talking about the longest continuous path of carbons. And remember, these are molecules. The way we draw them on paper doesn't dictate what the longest chain is. It is just the longest continuous path of carbons you have. So for example, if I have the molecule I just drew at the bottom left of the screen, and I take a look at this molecule, I have to find the longest path of carbons possible, and it can turn. It doesn't have to be drawn on the paper in a straight line. So in my very convoluted example here, my longest carbon chain has 12 carbons, but it's definitely not linear. It's going to go um, you know, from that bottom right corner and zigzag up and over through my molecule. So when we want to tell someone how many carbons are in your longest carbon chain, we're going to use a core name. And um, these names you must memorize. If there's one carbon in your longest carbon chain, it is meth. Two is eth. Three is prop. Four is but. Five is pent. Six is hex. Seven is hept. Eight is oct. Nine is non and 10 is deck. Um, yes, there's numbers for 11 and 12 and so on, but I only need you to know one through 10. Um, but this is gonna tell us how many carbons in our longest carbon chain. Now let's talk about how we use this to actually name things. We're gonna start with the simplest molecule here, and this is an alkane. So this is just carbons and hydrogen. So here's your process. You're gonna identify that longest carbon chain, taking a look and making sure it's not twisting and twirling around. You're gonna figure out what groups are attached to that parent chain. So are there branches jumping off? Um, or are there other things like halogens attached to it? You're gonna number the carbon chain so that the lowest number is nearest the first branch point or nearest the first substituent. If you have more than one of the same type of substituent, so substituents are the things added on to your longest carbon chain, then let's say I've got two chlorines. I'm gonna tell someone it's a dichloro compound. Um, and then once you've identified your main carbon chain, what's attached to it, where they are, you're gonna list all of your substituents in alphabetical order. And since this is an alkane, the ending on the name is A-N-E. 
Let me show you just one example. We'll do lots more of these in class. So let's use this process to name the molecule I just drew on the bottom of the screen. I need to find the longest carbon chain that is continuous and use that as my parent name. And we're going to add the ending A-N-E because this is a um, alkane. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in the longest carbon chain. So this is going to be hexane. We'll now look at what's attached and hanging off of that longest carbon chain. I have a one carbon group hanging off that longest carbon chain. So one carbon is meth. And to indicate that this is hanging off, we're going to use the ending YL. So this is a methyl group. And then we need to number the carbon chain so that um, we get our substituent to have the lowest number possible. And that makes this a three methyl group. There's only one methyl, so it's just three methyl. And um, the name therefore ends up being three methyl hexane. So for our last example on this slide, this lovely molecule that I drew would be named 2-ethyl-6-6-dimethyl-nonane. Nine carbons in the longest carbon chain. It is a uh, alkane, so the ending is A and E. And then I have three different substituents. I need to tell people how long, how many carbons are in each of those substituent chains, as well as what location they are um, attached to. And then I put ethyl first because ethyl comes before methyl in terms of alphabetical order. The diantri doesn't impact alphabetical order. Promise we're going to practice more in class. So I already pointed out that smaller branching carbon chains are going to be substituents, and we have a YL ending at the end of those. You've seen that. Other common substituents you're going to see are halogens, which are um, indicated as substituents by changing their name, like chlorine, into chloro or iodine into iodo. You can also find nitro groups, which their name as a substituent is just nitro and amines, so NH3 um, or NH2 or N with carbons on it, stuff like that, those are going to be called amino. If we have a cyclic alkane, um, we're going to use the prefix cyclo right before the parent name. And when it comes time to number these, you want to number them so that the um, substituents get the lowest possible numbers summing up. So go the direction in the ring that will get you the lowest numbers and so that the first um, number goes with the first substituent that will appear in your name, so alphabetically the first one. So I'm going to start numbering this one at the bromine because bromo comes before chloro. And so we get 1-bromo-3-chlorocyclohexane, and you'll notice that we are setting numbers off from the words with a hyphen, but that where you have words come together like chlorocyclohexane, that's just all strung together as one word. Okay, we're going to do lots of practice in class with all the other different um, functional groups that we're going to find, but as we start adding additional functional groups like alkenes, alkynes, alcohols, um, aldehydes, ketones, all of that, we're going to start changing the ending, and each of these functional groups has a different ending. So I've given you a list on the bottom left of the screen here. Copy it down. You're going to need it. Um, and I'm just going to do a single example here because we're going to do lots more examples in class and lots of practice in class. Okay, so here's my molecule. I spy a ketone because I've got a C double bond O in the middle of my carbon chain. Remember that C double bond O group is called a carbonyl group. So I've got a carbonyl in the middle of my chain. I need to find my longest carbon chain that contains the functional group. Your chains must contain that key functional group. And then I'm going to number it so that key functional group gets the lowest number possible. As this has seven uh, carbons, the core name is going to be hept. And so uh, heptane would be the alkane name. I'm going to change the ending of the alkane to make it heptanone. I need to tell someone where my C double bond O is, where that carbonyl is, so they know where the functional group is. That's at position two. So that'll go directly in front of the name with the suffix on it. And then I need to indicate substituents. I've got a little bit of branching here. I have a one carbon substituent at position five, so that's 5-methyl. And thus, I have 5-methyl to heptanone. Again, we're going to do lots more practice in class with this. Benzene rings are special. So they can either be a substituent if they are part of a molecule that has oxygen involved with it, and therefore a higher priority substituent, 
or they can be their own core functional group. Um, if they're the, a substituent, they're called a phenyl. However, if they're the most important thing going on, you're going to treat them similar to the way you would a cyclic alkane, and you're going to just number the substituents and say where they attach, making sure you get the lowest possible numbers um, and that the alphabetical first substituent gets the lowest number possible. So this molecule is 1,3-diethyl for methylbenzene. However, just so you know, because you're likely to see it at some point, if a benzene has only two substituents, there is an alternative way of indicating where those substituents are placed, and it has to do with which, um, which combination you have. Is it 1,2 substitution, 1,3, 1,4? And these can be called ortho, meta, and para substitutions. I am perfectly happy with you just numbering things, but I want to make sure you're aware that that alternative, so something like this being ortho, bromochlorobenzene, is out there and you're probably likely to see it at some point. Okay, lastly, a couple more key substituents you're going to come across. So I already mentioned that benyl as a substituent is a phenyl ring. So this is when it is part of a molecule with a more important functional group, typically containing oxygen. The other common substituent you're going to see is a vinyl substituent. And this is a carbon-carbon double bond attached to a molecule with a more important uh, functional group. So in this final example, as you look at that molecule, you have a carboxylic acid. That is going to take priority in terms of naming. And so that's going to form the base of this name. There are five carbons in the longest carbon chain containing that um, key functional group which means that the end of my name is going to be pentanoic acid. Because your carboxylic acid is always terminal, it's always at position when we don't have to include a number. Um, we have to talk about where those other substituents are. I have both a methyl substituent at position four, and I have the vinyl substituent. So that vinyl substituent, like I said, is just a carbon-carbon double bond that hangs off of your whole uh, molecule. And so we're gonna add those to our name. And this molecule is 4-methyl-3-vinyl pentanoic acid. We will do lots more practice in class with how to name and work with the naming process. It takes a little bit of practice to kind of get the process in your head, but then, like I said, it's very methodical, and so it's actually kind of satisfying.